Hi everyone, I am a grateful recovered alcoholic. My name is Katie Gordon. I have had the gift of sobriety since October the 28th of 1984, and I'm very grateful for that. I'm just grateful to be in Canada, if you want to know the truth. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just take a quick moment. Does anyone still have an extra seat next to them? You can hold your hand up way high, and you guys in the back, you got to scuttle quick if you want to grab a seat, but that's your shot I'm giving you. Um, you know, uh, I want to thank Josh. He has surrendered Saturday night, and if you travel around and speak a little bit, yeah, it's not the night you really want to surrender, so I'd like to thank Josh for giving up Saturday night, and Serena for switching Sunday to Friday. Um, let me tell you how my weekend has gone. <laughs> Your country is not easy to get into. And, and I'm telling you guys, I, I feel like I need an extra 15 minutes on the end of my talk because I can't leave your country without telling you what happened to get here. It was like planes, trains, and automobiles, right? And, and that's how it originally began. I, I, I get my passport, I look at it, it's, it's expired, I've got two months, no big deal. I try to do it online, I'm, I'm, I'm 51 years old, okay? Go ahead. I always look for that. I work hard at that. Um, I'm 51 years old, so, you know, doing it online is not that easy, right? I can't quite understand what they're... So I think I got it. I, th I think I got it. And I get, the, I get back this little card, and I think, well, this doesn't look right. You know, I sent them my, my passbook. And, and so I go down to immigration in Austin, and I said, look, this is what I got. It says it's not good for, you know, air travel, but it's good for land and water. And, uh, and, and the kid's name was Cullen, if that lets you know how old he was. And um, he comes to me and he, he goes, uh, uh, I think it's okay. I said, Cullen, I think is not going to work. I, I need to have you tell me you're sure this is going to get me into the country. And, and I said, and if you're not sure, I need your cell phone number. Because if I'm standing at customs and I can't get in, I'm calling you. And I mean, by this point, he's a little nervous. He goes on his computer and comes back. He goes, no, ma'am, I, I am 100% sure that'll get you in the country. Cullen is wrong. <laughs> okay? So I can't even get out of Austin, Texas, right? And that is when you really, really, at that moment when the, when the U.S. Air said, you're not getting on the plane, uh, the language was so unacceptable from me that you do not want general service office seeing a videotape of that. You know what I mean? Now, the good news is it wasn't at anybody. It was just in the air. You know what I mean? But everyone knew that down at U.S. Air there was a serious problem. <laughs> And I am flipping out, you know, and I'm, I'm using the big words, the big words, the big words that, you know, can insult a lot of people. And, uh, and I just, I couldn't believe it. And the, the little, you know, supervisor comes out and goes, man, I am so sorry. So I get outside and, you know, my fiance goes in there and he's, he's trying to work his magic and his passport scans and his luggage is getting on. And, and he tells the little supervisor, he goes, man, I'm not leaving if she can't go. And uh, so I'm out front, and this woman circles the airport and comes back and goes, I saw you crying. Is everything okay? It's like, no. <laughs> and I, I told Charlie, I said, you take me over to see Cullen right now. <laughs> and, you know, that's the, that's the place in Alcoholics Anonymous I think you can relate to is that I am crazy enough to kill both of us. <laughs> and... Um, Charlie's like, Katie, we're not, we're not going to see Cullen right now. Uh -huh. And so the, the little guy from U.S. Air and Charlie are working some magic. He says, listen, what I can do, he goes, that, that card will get you across the border by land. And he said, I can fly you to Seattle. It's about an hour drive. No one has any good information. And I told Charlie, let's do it. Let's do it. You know, so we... We get there, we're getting ready to get to the Canadian border, and it's looking like I'm still going to make Friday night and not screw this entire event up, right? Charlie and I are getting ready to go through, we're kind of watching them at customs, you know, we're used to Mexico, going into Mexico, but this is a little bit more sophisticated. 
And, uh, you know, now they do have machine guns down in Mexico, but, and, but they still kind of look like, you know, a bunch of trying to herd cats. And, and so, uh, we're watching this deal go on and, and, uh, there's a chick in there and I'm thinking, she looks kind of like she knows what she's doing here, little Miss Barney Fife, you know. We pull in there and I, I'm thinking, fine, this little card's gonna get us through. We're all worried about me. You are not gonna believe what happened. My fiance gives her his passport. She pulls it out. She pulls it out of the little leather case because you know he's pretty cool, so he's got it in a little leather case. And he, and he goes, she goes, you have a Korean passport with your information glued in there. It's like, what? <laughs> and I mean, it was swap. It was. <laughs> Get out of the car. I'm looking at him going, what the hell? Korean passport. <laughs> Jesus. You know, we're worried about, well, the next thing you know, I need to tell you, I mean, he's all but handcuffed. They're reading him his rights. It's a federal offense. He's going to jail. I am not coming into your country again. <laughs> and I am alcoholic, and I don't know about you, but I don't care. I just want to get here. You know, and so I'm thinking, well, I'll tell you what, I'll get here and I'll ask for an attorney, and while you're in the clink, honey, we'll, you know, we'll send you somebody, and, uh, Oh, my God. And, and let me tell you, they are intimidating there at that border. I mean to tell you, they did some, they, they, they just badger you and badger you. And, you know, they're like, empty your pockets. And I got on some, you know, designer jeans. Well, the pocket's about that deep. You know, you're like, man, that's it, honey. There ain't nothing in that pocket. You know, the zipper is that long, for God's sakes, you know. And, uh, and then she wants me to unbutton the thing. I didn't even know it unbuttoned. You know, I'm like, oh, come on. You know, and she's standing there. And, and once again, you know, never forgetting alcoholism. I've had it. I have had it. Now, granted, I wasn't the one with the, the forged passport. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I wasn't in as much trouble as he was, which is always good. But I told her at one point they would ask me a question and then you couldn't answer it. And then they would badger you and keep badgering you. And I just finally held my hands up and I said, listen, I am done. I thought, that's it. I don't care if you have a gun. I'm going to sit down, you know. And you can see Charlie looking at me like. like I've had it. Oh, my God. Well, come to find out this is what finally ended up happening is. Someone clearly, we have our house very open to alcoholics, such a trustworthy group. And his passport is in the junk drawer in the kitchen. And somebody has taken his passport, which, by the way, is worth $5,000 on the open market, the U.S. passport. We didn't know that. Had we still been drinking, I probably could have told you how much a passport was worth. <laughs> but since we've been sober a while, we're kind of out of the loop. And um, so it's worth $5,000. So somebody has taken his passport, photocopied it, taken a Korean passport, glued his information in it, and we don't know it. We just open it to see if it's expired. It's in that little fancy, you know, leather deal. And so when we hand it, we just set off a bomb. <laughs> so there you have it. They did let us in the country. But before they let us in, in my purse, there's a thing called BC powder. Is anybody at all familiar with BC powder up here in Canada? No. Well, it's good stuff, man. It is. BC powder is aspirin, and it's completely fine, like cocaine. And it's, it's folded in little white paper. And it comes in a box, and the box always gets smushed in my purse, so I put it in a little tin canister. Yeah. So I'm sitting over there. At one point, he goes, turn to the wall. You can't watch, you know, and I'm turning the wall and I have to watch curling. <laughs> what is up with that sport? I mean, it looks like house cleaning on crack cocaine, you know. It's like... So at one point I thought, this is torture, I cannot watch the curling anymore. 
the news is right behind me, and I want to watch the woman in California that was in that, you know, scion flipping everybody out. And so, I, so I'm just like, oh, forget it. I'm turned around. He can just arrest me. <laughs> and so the guy goes, Mary, Mary Gordon, which that's the name I never use. I come over there, and he goes, what is this? <laughs> and you know what? When you've been sober 24 years, heck, you could be sober for two years, and you're like, aspirin. <laughs> That is aspirin, buddy. I ain't got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> I mean, that feeling, I have crossed the border many times where that would have been him <gasps> freaking out. And he goes, what do you mean it's aspirin? I said, it's BC powder. I don't know if you have it in your country. Da, da, da. I said, taste it. And he goes, I am not tasting it. <laughs> So then he, he gives me, you know, acetaminophen. Well, aspirin's what I call it. I don't know what you call it. But. So he Googles BC powder, and sure enough, there, there it is. Which, by the way, it's doggone good stuff. It'll get rid of a headache in 15 minutes. Okay, so that's it. I did pretty good, honey. I, I did that story in 10 minutes. So, everyone for being so kind as to allow us to switch and the reason I can't be the Sunday morning speaker is because we only have a 48 hour pass in your country yeah yeah they want us back at the border at 9 a.m. had a ball in Canada oh for God's sakes it's right up against the U.S. I mean how difficult can that be thinking, honey, just distract them and I'll run across real quick. <laughs> oh, well, so be thinking about us at nine o'clock tomorrow when he tries to get across without a passport. <laughs> they confiscated his illegal Korean passport. <laughs> Korean. <laughs> okay, so back to my life. I, uh, the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous have gotten me in touch with a God that is crazy in love with Katie. I mean, whoo, I just never knew I could have a God that loved me so much. And I'm telling you guys, it, it, it blows me away. The longer I'm sober, I get blown away at the level that these 12 steps can bring you to. Now, that was not my experience through my entire 24 years of sobriety. A lot's happened in 24 years. One of the things the book uh, suggests is that I share with you what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now. And I, I like to look at that as kind of like what I was like without God in my life and drugs and alcohol, and even before drugs and alcohol, how my life turned out with God in my life. And that's hopefully the journey I'll take you through today. I, uh, I am someone who has tremendous integrity. I have dignity. That is not what I came in here with. I came in here at 26 years old in 1984. And uh, what led up to before I got sober was basically I was, a, um, I was a third born. I was a child of the 50s. Let's hear it for those 50 babies. <laughs> I have glasses because I can no longer read. I was born in 1958. I was the youngest of three. My brothers and sisters each two years older. That's just what you did in the 50s. And uh, so, um, you know, it's me, my sister, and my brother. We were um, pretty much just your middle, middle, upper middle class American family. And uh, my dad was a traveling salesman for Union Carbide. He was an electrical engineer. I think, civil engineer, some sort of an engineer. And uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. That's just what they did, right? And, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. Alcoholism, to me, happened long before I took the drink. Now, I didn't know that. But looking back on my life, I completely understand that. There were two things I loved to do as a kid. One was to hyperventilate. And the other was Vicks Formula 44, man. I dug both those things. And do I have any hyperventilators in the room? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you're proud of it. By God. You know, we would, you know, wrap a towel up and choke you till you passed out. And then when you came to, 
it, it really, it's a good test to see who's alcoholic and who's not, because whoever came out of that terrified probably is not one of us. But whoever came out of that and went, do it again, is probably either in this room or needs to be in this room, you know? I love to hyperventilate, and we were hyperventilating at an early age, you know? I mean, we were just doing anything you could do to alter the way you felt, because I never, I didn't really necessarily feel like I didn't fit in. I felt like I had to excel to beat you to be okay, not to even be close to equal. I needed to beat you to know I was okay. I was competitive in everything I did. One of the things was um, in school, I was, I, I just absolutely hated school. A anyone else hate school? I mean, hated it. Oh, God. I even hated taking my kids to school. You know, I mean, I just, the whole concept of school just bugged me. And, uh, and, you know, it's funny because, you know, I, I'm, I'm long past this. You know, I could have gone back to college. I could have done anything. I just had no desire. And what ended up happening is I, uh, you have to become a pretty good cheater if you hate school. So I became a professional cheater. And, and in that professional cheating, I mean, I took it to levels that you can't even imagine where you broke back into the school. You left a window unlocked because you could go in there and change the grades because it wasn't all computer and it's all just a number two pencil. And it was, it was really easy. And, um, and I mean, I was crafty. And I was crafty from early on. And that crafty, I'm, I'm telling you, had I, had I set that in the right direction, I really think you'd have a, well, you'd have Serena up here, the PhD, but, uh, you know, I, I had that in a, the, all the wrong directions, you know, and so I basically cheated through school, which, you know, I don't know about you guys, but when you cheat through school, you learn nothing, and, you know, you don't, you don't know the history of Canada, right, you know, I told Charlie, I went, wow, it's a heavy Asian influence here, he goes, well, Katie, you know, back when China did blah, 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 like, I got nothing. Didn't care about the U.S. history. Really don't care about the China history. I mean, the Canadian history. Just a comment. You know. And, um, and it, you know, it, it just, it's never appealed to me. But then you come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and what do they do? They go, here's a book. You go, oh, that's not, mm-mm. You got it on tape or anything? And I'm not, I'm not digging a book, man. And, uh. One of the things about a book, excuse me, I thought I had something crawling on me. It's my own scarf. Um, I was like, what is shifting? What is this country about, man? Um, and so they hand you a book. Well, I don't comprehend. I mean, I can read, I can write, I can add, but I don't really comprehend. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I know I got a room full of cheaters out there. And so, you know, and then, then you got your brainiacs, which I don't even relate to. But your cheaters, I'm with you. And so it's one of those things that, you know, you just go, oh, my God. You know, somebody goes, well, it's in the book on page such and such. You're like, Wee! And, uh, you know, I just, I couldn't figure out where step one was. You remember that? You're like, why don't they have step three? I'm obviously overlooking step one. Come on, flip, 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 flip. But uh, so I'm tooling along, and I've got to uh, I got to get through my drinking. It, it's really not that it's long and it's painful, but let's zip through because a lot more has happened in sobriety than in drinking. So we're tooling along, and you know I'm the youngest of three, and so um, and we're we're a pretty fun family. My dad was an ex professional football player. He played for the um, Steelers, and and then before he went into uh, Union Carbide and worked in the steel industry, and. So my mother gets sick, right? And um, I don't know, you know, you guys that were born in the 50s and the, uh, the 40s know that, you know, you couldn't go into the hospitals back in the day. And, and um, my dad says, your mom is really sick. And we're thinking, what? I mean, she seems fine to me. And we go up to the hospital. It's really uncomfortable and a lot of whispering. Kids weren't allowed in the hospitals back then. And, and uh, we go see her in this room, and it, it looks bad. And, you know, when you got a stay-at-home mom and you're, you're middle-upper America, it, 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 everything's not looking really good. And, and so the, we say, you know, we talk to her, and then we leave. And the next morning, my dad comes in and says, you know, your mom died last night. And, yeah, it was tragic, tragic. I was 9, Liz was 10, Mike was 12. And, um, and you know, you, you couldn't tell me that, that that's why I drank. If you went through the pain of losing your parent in that deal, 
as a kid, you drink too. And, and that's really, for the longest time, I thought that's why I drank. I had no idea I was alcoholic. No idea. And of course, I did, you know, tremendous amount of outside issues. And I, I'm very respectful of singleness of purpose um, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I think if, if you're not looking into the traditions and if you are more power to you, you know, we got to keep this thing alive for our kids, 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 right? And singleness, singleness of purpose is huge. And, uh, you know, it's not out of disrespect, it's out of respect. And when I was early in sobriety, I couldn't, I, I didn't have much respect for singleness of purpose. I thought it was ridiculous. And now I'm an old timer and I'm the one preaching singleness of purpose. So go figure. Um, so my mother, my mother ends up passing away and, and we're all devastated. And my dad, you know, basically has this big party. And the next thing you know, guys, in six weeks, he gets married. Oh, I know. Bless his heart. He was one of us. And he was really doing the best he could. And he moves this woman in with her two kids. And they last a weekend. That's it. They're in, they're out. It was all good with me. I didn't like the kids anyway. So it was like, well, then three months later, in comes this hot chick. And he marries her. And we're thinking, hmm. Now, in between there, we end up having six live-in housekeepers. <laughs> so... so and she lasts like two months, and she's gone. And then another one comes in, and she's got two kids, and she ends up lasting. But so in an 18-month period, my dad married three times and had six live-in housekeepers because he, he was a traveling salesman. And, you know, that, that'll make you drink. And um, so, so once again, you know, we got, and we're in the 60s now, man. It, it, it's all about drinking and outside issues and the whole nine yards, right? And so uh, we're, I am digging drinking. The first time I took a drink, it was, we called it a depth charge. And it was, you know, behind my dad's bar, lots of drinking in my family. You just poured all the liquor in one glass and then handed it to Katie. And Katie drank it. And I loved it. And I knew the first time I drank, I was going to do a lot of that. <laughs> a lot of this, man. That feeling is great. Well, it's hard to get liquor when you're underage. It's hard to get liquor when you're 12, right? <laughs> Even though the drinking law in Texas was 18, it was not easy. So how did you get liquor? You sat in front of the 7-Eleven and you waited for the sickest man to come and you asked him to buy you some. Come on, you, got, you women know the guy. <laughs> the creep. And the creep is in the room right now. I know he is. <laughs> the liquor for the young girls and then kind of came out <laughs> and then he was like trying to get a booger off your finger man you could not lose that guy for nothing and you're you know you're bobbing and weaving and you didn't have a car so you're in the woods trying to lose the old man who was probably 28 <laughs> and uh oh i remember that mm 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 but one, once again, you know, there was Boone's Farm Apple Wine, Spinata, we had the vodka, you know, we had all the liquor going in the woods, man, and it was great. I mean, I remember alcohol being a blast, and it probably turned into not being good, mm, I want to say maybe 19, you know, so from 12 to 19 is pretty doggone good as far as I can remember. Not a lot of responsibilities. I left home at 15. Uh, never went back, uh, wasn't a runaway. My dad was like, done, you know, that, that, that lets you know what, how much work I was as a kid. And, uh, he had just had it. And so I, I'm out on my own. I am so full of pride. I was insistent on finishing school. Um, you know, I, I, even though I cheated my way through school, I needed to have that diploma because I could not be a loser. See, every, all this always, it kept going back to if I do that, then I'm a loser. You know, <laughs> I am also very powerful. <laughs> well, <laughs> turn on the music. <laughs> We can do this in the dark, yes, you can still see me. So, you can still hear me. My, my father told me you never had a problem hearing me. So, um, let's see, where was I? 
my dad, I left home. Oh, the pride, the level of pride. See, I had moral and philosophical convictions galore, right? I mean, I had this list that I had to live up to, period, right? And so I am sitting there. Oh, I did get off those teleprompter things. Darn it. I like those. Um, was I looking pretty good on those over there? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. See, staying sober a long time, by God, you look good. Is this what the old timers looked like when you came into AA? (laughs) Oh, come on, I love the old timers. I happen to be one of them now. But it's the level, guys, of incomprehensible demoralization that kicked my butt. That is the part that brought me to my knees. I could not live with ticking one more thing off that moral calendar. I mean, that moral list. Another thing I've done, I swear to God, I'd never do. Another thing I've done, I swear to God, I've never done. I never do. And and I ended up getting pregnant, and uh, you know, I had a I had a child, and here, you know, I'm divorced now. I've been with this guy for too long. And he's crazy and I'm crazy and and uh, I'm dragging this little girl through places she had no business being. You guys that have kids and you drag them through this disease it just cuts away at your moral fibers. It cuts away at everything. And uh, when I got sober she was five. And the story goes like this. I'll try to condense it as quickly as I can. Uh, I'm tooling along. I am so burning it at, at both ends. Oh, there we go. I am so, see there, yep, 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 yep. I am burning it down at both ends, right? I, I need something so bad. I'm so grateful. We have a thing in, in um, the United States called Child Protective Services. I know you have something like that here. And, and uh, I am so grateful that they did not take my child away. However, had they taken my child away, something still would have gotten my attention. And uh, so... I'm dragging poor little April all through this stuff, and I get this buddy of mine calls me. Now, I've heard of AA twice, and keep in mind, AA is not happening. You know what I'm saying? Today, isn't it all over everywhere, you know, treatment and do this, and are you suffering from depression? And You know, that was not the commercials 24 years ago. You know, there was no Cialis and Viagra and all the... I think the solution to the Viagra problem is those two people need to get in the same bathtub. Have you ever seen that? It's like, well, just get in the same tub. The plumbing will work. But you'd have to know the commercial to get my point there. Maybe a United States commercial. So um, so I, I've got this... Um, I'm not, I've never been a blackout drinker, right? Uh, it was, that was not my drinking career. You do not have to be, um, in order to be an alcoholic, you do not have to be a blackout drinker. You do not have to have lost everything. You don't have to have lived in your car. You don't have to have lost your teeth for alcoholism. Now, you can go there, and it'll take you there. It's almost a guaranteed ticket. But that was not as far down as I went. So my buddy calls me. I've heard of Alcoholics Anonymous twice. And he calls me and he says, hey, Katie, there's a big speaker coming into Austin, Texas for an AA convention. And and I was wondering if I could stay at your house. And keep in mind, this guy and I did, you know, we we rolled in the hay a lot, right? It was the 80s. It was fairly safe back then. (laughs) It's not like it is today. And uh, another thing to be grateful for for 24 years. And so... um, and he says, I'm bringing a buddy of mine with me. And I'm thinking, well, okay, I got this chick staying here. You know, maybe we could hook them up or whatever, whatever. And uh, I said, but listen, I don't really want to hear about your AA world. I don't want to hear about anything. I am fine. And it was Halloween weekend, and I was Tina Turner was just super hot back then. Remember her in the 80s with the gold hair and the fishnets and what kind of a dress like this that I have on today? And... Um, <laughs> She uh, she was my hero, you know. She was just that strong woman, and so uh, I'm going to be Tina Turner at this party that I'm clearly going to find a man at that is going to save my life because that's what I think is going to fix me. I know the women completely know what I'm talking about, and you guys, you guys are going. I'll take I'll take the ticket today. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'll go I'll go in it today. So. I'm getting ready for this party. I, Tony knocks on the door. He comes in, and, he, and I'm giving him a hug, and I'm looking at his buddy, Joe, and I'm thinking, wow. 
<laughs> Cute. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, that alcoholic mind, of course, looking back, I'm thinking, great. I'm setting him up with this girl that's staying at my house, you know. And, and then, you know, you just spin out of control. That alcoholic thinking, that level of self-centeredness is shocking to the rest of the world. Shocking. <laughs> it's shocking to us in AA when we get to watch it, right? And so... So I'm giving, you know, Tony a hug and I'm realizing, man, I dig this guy. And so I, I, we end up going and playing together, Tony and I and Joe, and we have a great day. And all of a sudden I realize, my God, you know, I can't drink around them because, you know, they're alcoholic. And I guess, you know, they might grab my beer and that would really be bad. And then I'd be responsible for them drinking. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's what I thought about AA. I thought AA was the winos, you know, the, the, the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the barrel. And so that evening I get ready to go to my party. My hair is gold. It's, you know, God dang, I look good. And, uh, I got a picture of me. I don't keep it out because that's not necessary, but I do have a picture and all my stuff. And, and so I'm getting ready to leave and the boys are going to go hear Bobby speak somewhere. And, and, um, my car breaks down because every drunk's car breaks down. Right? Right before the big moment, it's got to break down, and it's raining. And I get out of my car two blocks away. I walk in the house. I absolutely cannot believe it. It's Halloween weekend. It's in the 80s. Everybody's not really dressing up back then. And uh, I come in, and the boys go, well, what happened? And I say, oh, my car broke down. And they go out there, and they drive, you know, walk two blocks, look at it, and go, man, it, it's not going anywhere. It's like, oh, that's just crazy. You know, and this is when the drinking was quit working a long time ago, so I'm angry all the time. You with me? Yeah, yeah, I'm angry all the time. So they said, come come here, Bonnie Raitt, man. We're going to go down to Antone's after we hear Bob, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, yeah, great. I got this party. I'm supposed to meet the man of my dreams. This is all really working out well. So we take my girlfriend with me who's making out with this Joe guy who I think is incredibly hot, and I'm stuck with my buddy, Tony. <laughs> Come on, you can go back to that, that, that same evening, yes? So um, I'm realizing the... the, the <laughs> it's okay, I can work with anything. So they... So they um, so we go out that night, and um, now keep in mind, it's Halloween. I'm dressed like Tina Turner, but nobody at Antone's is in a costume but me. And uh, so I look like a hooker. I don't look like, there's no strong woman happening there, right? I am looking like a hooker, and I am really not having fun. And Joe is making out with this chick, and I wanted to be the one making out with him. And Tony's bugging me, just on every level, bugging me. And, uh, and so with, as the evening goes on, I end up, uh, you know, we, we go inside. I've gotten some outside issues when no one was looking. I'm drinking. I'm, I'm running the gamut. And I go into the bathroom when we get home. And I sit there, and I'm smoking cigarettes, and I'm flicking them in the tub because, you know, we are dramatic. <laughs> <sighs> Nobody understands my pain. <laughs> You know, can you imagine what that looks like, Tina Turner, at the end of an evening? You know what I mean? I mean, it is not a pretty picture. And nobody comes to knock on the door. Nobody is checking on Katie. And I keep thinking, come on, knock on that door. I'll open it. What? You know? Oh, my God. So here comes the thinking. You know how that late night thinking comes? Either you're rapid dialing or you're thinking. And I thought... I know what I can do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest I go one to one of those AA meetings with them because I, they're going to an AA meeting tomorrow. That way, my girlfriend Robin will not come, and I'll have both those boys' attention to myself. I think this is such a great plan. You guys know the late night plan. It's about four in the morning. <sighs> What a good idea. So I go in there and I wake Tony up and I go, Tony, I think I've got a drinking problem. <laughs> and he goes, what? And he, go, he looks at me and he goes, let me go get Joe. <laughs> I'm going, oh my God, I could not have written a script any better. This is perfect. <laughs> Both of them. So they're both just asking me questions, you know, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you know, and, and we, we go for about two hours till about six in the morning, you know, and, and now keep in mind, I'm 26 and they're 28 and 30. You got it? It's just young and alive. And, uh, and so we, uh, so that we're going to a meeting, right? Well, I don't really get a much, a lot of sleep because I've got a lot of outside issues happening. <laughs> right? And I am humming. And so the meeting is at 9 a.m. And I kind of vaguely remember closing my eyes, but you know, you don't go to sleep for hours, right? And so I think I may have dozed off for 20, 30 minutes. And then they go, come on, we're going to the meeting. So I jump up, you know, I get ready, I, you know, which means throw on clothes. And you go to the meeting, and I looked at one point at my hair, and it was gold, and it was like <laughs> bent. And, I mean, I was looking bad, bad, bad. You know, I had a lot of makeup on for Tina Turner, a lot of black eye, eye stuff, and it was not pretty. And so I get to that meeting, and I am scared to death. I'm thinking on the way over there, it's just such a bad idea, bad idea. Bail, bail, and I can't, I can't get out of it, you know. And so I walk in, and what, what was shocking that day was changed my life, absolutely changed my life. I was not expecting to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I walked in, I saw people like you, and the laughter was so appealing. I mean, it was like, it was the most fabulous day I had ever had, and I hadn't had, I hadn't laughed in a long time. And I was scared to death, and they said, is anybody new? And, you know, the whole group does this. <laughs> and, I mean, it was like, wow, they're pretty, pretty insightful. Have <laughs> you ever seen the new guy? I sort the... <laughs> Looks like their head's going to blow off. <laughs> you know. And they, they so think no one's looking. I love the guy who's been up all night who goes in the store and is, is not, the, not the total low bottom drunk. He's kind of, you know, and you're like, oh, oh dude. You're like, oh, oh, the sound of the birds. Oh, and by the way, the Border Patrol does not like being called dude. <laughs> I heard Charlie call him dude like three times, and I swear he goes, My name is Officer Duffy. <laughs> I thought, honey, stop calling him dude. It's clearly not digging the dude. And keep your hands out of your pockets. <laughs> oh, my God. We have told... Just electrifying up here, am I not? I swear. <laughs> no, thank you. I, uh, okay, you're giving me another 20 minutes for all this lighting problem. So, so <laughs> stop. <laughs> okay, so there we go. Okay, who's ever touching the button? He says, "Stop it." <laughs> Okay, so I, I come into AA. Well, here's, let me fast forward real quick. You know that Joe guy that was so cute? We got married. <laughs> yeah. I, I told Charlie, I am such a convincing woman. I am telling you. And it really works against me a lot of times. But um, Joe was six years sober, and he was Mr. AA. He'd come out of the Pacific Group in California. He was, you know, all about service, all about the big book. And he scooped me up, and here I was 10 minutes sober. This is not a good plan for somebody with six years who's working a great AA program. They're going, bad idea. And I'm thinking, I said, it is a great idea, great idea. Let's just keep going forth. Come on, we can do this. And so he taught me Alcoholics Anonymous like you wouldn't believe. I mean, he taught me everything. I was, I was chairing the Chrysanthemum Conference by two years. I was sponsoring. I was busting my butt through those steps. I mean, he would read me the big book because once again, you know, I did, I, I read, but I just didn't comprehend well. And so he would read it. He would explain it. I got a sponsor. I was active in AA. I was a year sober, and Charlie, uh, my fiancé, uh, uh, was a part of our litter. He was uh, at a meeting we had started. You know, you get pissed off, and you start your own meeting, and that's kind of how that deal works. And, and, you know, you leave the meeting you were at, and 
Charlie comes in, he's got six months sober, he's sharing in the back of the room, and I leaned over to Joe and I went, oh my God, this guy is a riot. We need to get to know him. And Joe's like, let's do it. So we scoop up Charlie, and or he scoops us up, I'm not sure, but there was about ten of us, because at least in Texas, young people was not happening. Okay, <clears throat> you went into AA meetings and they were, there was, there was a lot of old, crusty old timers. And, and they, and you know, we were the love children, <laughs> hated the rules, and you know, weren't going to do the blue, 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 blue. And now, I'm it. Okay? So put on your seatbelt. You're going to be it too. Alrighty? And um, so we scooped Charlie up, and, and here, let me date myself. You know, we would have, uh, Charlie was the camp coordinator, and we'd have Miami Vice night. I had a Miami Vice wedding. Oh, yeah, Don Johnson, my husband had the pink jacket with the, and the white tennis shoes, you know. I had the hair, and uh, oh, my God, it was, it was fabulous. And um, so here's the journey in Alcoholics Anonymous I took. The laughter in AA was spectacular. There was a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous had a couple of years sober. Before Joe and I, you know, actually got together, there was a three-week period. Any of you guys know that that's a tough time for somebody to stay sober, right? This is not where I plan to come. This is not what I plan to do, but I'm going to give it a shot in order for that guy to pay attention to me. i got to stay sober. Well, if you're an alcoholic like I am, that ain't going to make you stay sober. After day one and a half, I'm getting really itchy, thinking this is a bad idea. He's gone back to Huntsville, Texas. And this girl on day one took my phone number and this is my personal experience if you see a new guy in AA you take their number give them your number odds of them calling you slim you know I mean come on but why should they have to call you because they're ready how many of y'all were like couldn't wait to pick up the phone and call a stranger <laughs> hey man yeah listen I'm drinking in about eight minutes. You know, or you're already drinking and you're lying. And so, you know, and so this chick called me like crazy. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of a lot of things. I'm a big fan of the next time you go to your, your, your AA meeting that you've been going to forever, you look for that one person who's sitting all by themselves. I prefer the boys stick with the boys and the girls stick with the girls. Yes? Yeah. I am. That'll, that'll just piss off a lot of people, and that's good. Write a little inventory and see your part in it. And so here's the deal. What I think is, you know, you sit there and you look around the rooms and you see that one person sitting off there. You don't go meet with your friends and have your coffee yet and all that. And all of a sudden you, you scoop up that little person and you visit with them. And it's unbelievable what will happen because that's the purpose of that meeting. Right? That meeting is there for you to find that person sitting by their self. Well, this chick, Michelle, changed my life. And that, bless her heart, she didn't stay sober. Uh, as a matter of fact, she's got two years sober and I have 24. So she went back out for 20 years. Yeah, God bless her. Every time I see her, we get, see, look, we get goosebumps. There's the light. <laughs> These guys are following my cue notes back there. Great. <laughs> and so... Um, the obsession to drink was gone in about 90 days. I'm busting my butt through the steps. I still firmly believe you ought to work your butt off and get through those steps fast. For God's sakes, we want you to have a spiritual awakening. Don't be sitting on those steps for long. You know, yeah, it's these people who go, you know, in the first step where I'd like for you to write everything you're powerless over. And the book tells you you won't be able to remember a week or a month ago the pain and suffering. So ain't going to happen. You know what I mean? I mean. That's my own opinion, and I got a lot of them. And uh, so one of the things is, is, you know, I was taught to bust your butt, get through those steps as fast as you can. Well, the obsession's gone at 90 days, and God dang it, guys, life gets good. I mean, good. A lot of people had that experience. Yeah, you got, you got blessing after blessing after blessing. My business takes off. I have, we have another baby. April, Joe's able to adopt April. We're married. We got the little picket fence. We got everything we want. And you know what happens? Don't even know it. All of a sudden I go, man, hey guys, hey, hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. I got my life back. So good luck. Well, Katie, aren't you going to be? No, no, I don't need to do that. So, and Joe said, you know what we need, Katie? We need Jesus. <laughs> 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 
And it makes Charlie crazy when I say Jesus, but by God, we went and found Jesus. We did. He goes, can't you say religion or something? Oh, no, no, we found Jesus. And there is a big difference. Because when you're not working the 12 steps and you find Jesus, who? It is not pretty. And... And so some people can do both of them together, and it really is appealing uh, for some. Or, you know, whatever it is, Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever religion you choose to find, as long as you keep your 12 steps alive. Well, we didn't. We just found Jesus. And, um, and you know, I have pictures of Joe and I, and we look almost Amish. <laughs> I mean, Joe is a good-looking man. He's got this whole... You know, we just needed the pink and, you know, and so uh, what ended up happening is as much as I loved um, what I found in Jesus, um, I got angrier and angrier and angrier. And, you know, there's a there's a a saying in Christianity that says, you know, um, love the sinner, hate the sin. And I I tell you, I hated the sinner. (laughs) And um, it's called resentment. And when you're not working the 12 steps, that's what's going to happen. The book tells us everything that's going to happen. And so all of a sudden I told Joe there was a woman who wasn't taking a right on red, which we did find out in your country is a legal right turn, correct? The red light, you, we got to a red light. I told Joe, I go, go turn. The border patrol might be somewhere close just waiting for us to screw up, honey. You know, he's like, well, I think I can turn. I go, go for it. Come on, just haul ass. So we take, this woman won't take a right turn, and I mean, I lose it. I am losing it. I'm ready to pull her out of her car. That's six years sober with Jesus. And and so I, I told Joe, I, I remember calling him going, man, I am not doing good. He goes, I'm not doing good either, honey. And he goes, let's, let's go. I'll meet you at the noon meeting at North, and we hadn't been to a meeting in three years. So we go, yeah, because we, we found Jesus. I told you already. And so we go. Now, see, I, unbeknownst to me, I don't know any of this. We are incredibly actively involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, guys. It's a disease of delusion. You know, the book tells us we rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble. <laughs> see, they're working on my cues, aren't they? That's how that works. These boys are good. And so I ended up, um, this this level of delusion, you know, I don't know. So we walk into an AA meeting, the noon meeting. There's our buddy Ed H. He's got about 800 years sober. And, and he is pounding that Rolex when he would, you know, make his point. And I leaned over to Joe and I went, oh, my God, honey, we're home. We're home. And he goes, we sure are. Now, I'm six years sober. He's 12 years sober. And and I love what Serena said last night. That is a dangerous time in Alcoholics Anonymous. I think it's really between three and four years and ten years. Because you've kind of done everything, right? You've been through enough holidays. You've done some of the work. And you've done it. Well, let me tell you how this baby turns out. Little do we know at that point what we've got is meeting-based sobriety. Are you familiar with that term? That means I don't know where my big book is, and I really don't have a sponsor, but I go to a meeting about every day, and I get relief. I don't get freedom. I get relief. And I get relief until I get to the next meeting. Now, I once again, I don't know this is happening. I've worked your twinkie, your hinky 12 steps, and, and, and I don't really need them. I just need to kind of sit in this meeting. Well, I find the sickest meeting. Because that's what you need to do, too. If you're not going to do the work, you really have to find a meeting where nobody's doing the work. Because when somebody comes in that is doing the work, they're bugging you. And then they have all these suggestions for you. and Right? So I find the sickest group. As a matter of fact, we were a group that we really preferred to not even read out of the big book. Yeah. And they're still going strong. But I I just kind of stay away because I'm not the person to bring that message back. You know what I'm saying? You guys can go take the message to them. (laughs) 
And um, so I'm sitting there, and I have not got a clue that I am in untreated alcoholism. Now, granted, you can call it what you want. You can call it dry, but I think dry does not give it the power it needs. You know, dry to me kind of is like a bit of a headache. I am in untreated alcoholism. I suffer from a disease. Man, this scarf keeps moving and freaking me out. Uh, I am suffer. I suffer from a disease. So doesn't dry sound almost too flippant? Yeah, I'm untreated alcoholism, and and. I think it is really, really serious in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think there are a lot of people suffering from untreated alcoholism and don't know it. And so I'm going to give you a couple of tips of what it looks like. And, and here's the deal. To carry the message to the person who's been around a while, doesn't have a clue they're in untreated alcoholism, is very, you got to be very careful. Because the last thing I want to do is piss you off. Because see, if you're in untreated alcoholism, you're not working the steps, so you're just mad. Right. If you're an untreated alcoholism and you're working the steps, well, well, you wouldn't be. If you're in AA and you get mad at me, you do an inventory and your sponsor shows you your part. Right? Not me. Because I'm not the problem. Are you following me? At least my sponsor does not ever say, you know what, Katie, that person is an idiot. Does your sponsor ever say that? Oh, no. My sponsor goes, well, let's look at your, let's look at your part. Here we go again. Let's look at my part. Let's look at my part. And sometimes I think I sell the story so well that one day she's going to go, well, that person is an idiot. <laughs> never once, never once. So I'm too long untreated alcoholism. I get a sponsor so you people get off my back when I go to another meeting and they go, well, do you have a sponsor? Absolutely. I don't use her, but I have her. <laughs> I don't know where my big book is. That's another tip. If you haven't read your big book in the last month. <clears throat> so, oh yeah, there's lots. Of, see, this is when the crowd stops laughing. <laughs> oh yeah, they, all of a sudden she was so funny with that light thing and now not really digging her anymore. And uh, yeah, <laughs> It's the price I have to pay for delivering this message. And then they leave. That's the other thing that happens. So, no, I'm kidding. So, um, so I am, uh, I'm almost at 17 years sober, maybe 15 years sober, and my husband gets sick, bad sick. He has a brain tumor. And, oh, it's terrible, and it's tragic, and, and I go crazy because I'm in untreated alcoholism. So what do I have to do? I am the victim of the delusion. I love that Serena read that line. That line is my life. You could tattoo that across my butt, man. I am the victim of the delusion that I can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I just manage well. My husband is sick. Back the heck up, you AA people. Of course I can't sponsor anybody. Don't you see what's going on in my life? I must take charge here. And I'm starting to work like a fiend. I start to have anxiety attacks because I'm restless, irritable, and discontented, right? I got the malady all over me. I am just, I, this is another tip, too. If you ever are defending that you're not going to drink today, well, I mean, I'm not going to drink. Huh. That almost sounds like I have a choice in the matter, doesn't it? book tells me I don't have a choice, right? I've lost the power of choice and drink. So that, that statement is, I don't, I don't normally say that statement if I'm working a spiritual program, right? So see, you see how these things start. And so Joe gets sick. He's got this big old brain tumor. Oh, it's terrible. He's going to, he's going to live. We don't know how long. Yada, 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 yada. It goes on for some time and uh, he dies. And I'm, I'm 20 years into a marriage with the man that I can't even believe he dies. I lean heavily on Charlie. Charlie's been my best friend for, for 24 years. He's been like a brother to me. And <laughs> Now, we are engaged, so there has to be a little bit of s storytelling here. Um, <laughs> There, we are like brother and sister, so I don't want to get too Oklahoma crazy on you here. Uh, we are from Texas, so I know that may happen in Texas, but not in my neck of the woods. And so we, we are, 
<laughs> okay, this is how we got together. See, they dropped the lights. I'll get a little lower voice. So we, um, I'm leaning heavily on Charlie, and it is, he's an untreated alcoholism, I'm an untreated alcoholism, and I tell him, I said, the monkey's on my back, the, the um, compulsion to, to, to use again has come back, right? I'm ready to drink, and I'm using a lot of ego and pride to keep that back down, but the truth is that will last only till it stops. I don't know what day that's going to be, but it's going to stop, and I'm going to drink, right? Anyone knows that, that untreated alcoholism comes long before that drink is taken, right? And so Charlie, in the best of his um, untreated alcoholism, says to me, he said he said a lot of things to me, but I don't remember. He said, well, don't drink without me. Well, that actually did work for a couple of months, didn't it, honey? And uh, But he goes, God, Katie, you make me look so bad when you say that. And But that was the truth. That's all he had to offer. You know, there was no, you know, getting me into the work and doing all that stuff to, to prevent this. And, and so um, what ends up happening is Joe dies. I'm losing it. I'm, I'm ready to drink. I'm ready to throw it away. And... It's unbelievable how God throws you life vest or life raft after life raft, doesn't he? And, and you don't even see them. I mean, they could be whizzing by. How many times have you ever seen that you are the miracle for somebody and they don't even see it? Yeah. See, I mean, he's constantly sending that. And actually, I'm, I'm here to tell you guys, if you're in untreated alcoholism, I am your miracle. <laughs> So I am trying to tell you the message. I hope you hear it. And uh, um, so I always tell people, if you've been asking God for help, this is what it looks like. <laughs> but what what ended up happening is, and, and yeah, you boys are not supposed to go anywhere bad with that, okay? This is, this is to the girls I was talking to. And so what ended up happening is, is Charlie goes, Katie, uh, well, I make a move on him, and he can't believe it because we're like brother and sister. There's no, been no sexual innuendos, no nothing ever in our relationship. I'm supposed to grow old with Joe. What happened here? And and Charlie was like, woo, 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 Wally. And then he goes, oh, come on, come on, come on let's talk about it. Yeah, that lasts about 32 seconds. And uh, needless to say, it was one of the greatest gifts that has ever happened in my life. And he and I have been together for five years. We're, we're working on getting married, which the Border Patrol wanted to know when. And that has been the bone of contingent in our, mar- in our relationship. And the girl asked when, and I thought, oh, you don't even want to hear the story there, honey. <laughs> Trust me. So I just shot a date out. I thought, there, I lied. (laughs) You made me lie over something stupid. So so we end up, Charlie says, Katie, he goes, he's an untreated alcoholism. I'm an untreated alcoholism. We don't know it. We don't know it, right? We're, 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 We're lying, cheating. Lying and cheating. I mean, you know, that cash register honesty we talk so much about. When There is nothing worse at 17 years when you're just lying flat, lying to people. And they're like, oh, so what, oh, lie, lie. <laughs> and you hate everybody. Everybody bugs you. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, everybody's bugging you. So Charlie says, Katie, there's this big book weekend. And I'm like, what? I go, I, the last thing I want to do is spend a weekend in that stupid book. And he goes, come on, man. It, it looks like a good deal. Let's do the big book weekend. And I thought, and so we go to this big book weekend outside of Dallas, and Mark H. is there with another guy. And, uh, and you know, Mark, Mark H. is a good, good friend of ours, and Charlie's sponsor, and now we, we've, everything's evolved. You talk about God putting his hand in there, like I said, those little miracles. I mean, he's just guiding Charlie and I, and we're taking the bait, and we're swimming downstream, you know what I mean? And so... Uh, we're sitting in that meeting, and, and it's a three-day meeting, and all Mark talks about is the disciplines, the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12, the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12, and you're like, la, 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 la. <laughs> I looked over at Charlie, I go, tell him to shut up. Man, there's no disciplines, there's no nothing. I mean, all I'm doing, if I'm lucky, is opening one of those little 24-hour meditation books at the red light. 
You know what I mean? I mean, that's the, that's the extent of my prayer and meditation. Now, I got a sponsor that I haven't called in five years, and I read that at the red light, so I'm doing prayer and meditation to keep you people off my back, but that's, that's about the length of what it looks like, and, and Mark is saying, you know, talking about this, you know, disciplines of 10, 11, and 12, 10, 11, 12, and then you have to go back to your little, little cottage room and, and, uh, do some sort of stupid homework, which is called the 11 step review. Never heard of that thing. Didn't know where it was in the book. And Charlie's over there, you know, diligently because he's so much of a people pleaser. He's got to do the work. And uh, he goes, aren't you going to do your homework? And I'm like, I am not doing my homework. That's stupid. (laughs) And that was at 17 years sober. And when God had to really chisel at me. I was not eagerly looking for the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to fix me because I've already done them. Anybody said that before? I've already done your hinky little steps. I know what they do. Blah, blah, blah. Well, here we go. Put your seatbelt on, folks, because from this point on, my life gets rocketed into a dimension I didn't even know was available. And here's how it goes. On page 20, it says, Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depends upon our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. What? (laughs) Page 20? You sure that's not around like 96? (laughs) You know, so at page 20, you want me to constantly think of others? Well, the whole book is about others. The other thing Serena said Friday night that I thought was so spectacular is on page 62, the book takes a hard turn. When it talks about alcohol, all alcohol, alcohol, mental, the the allergy, the, the mental obsession, the whole concept of step one, the problem that we have, it takes this radical turn in the third step that says selfish and self-centered. That is the root of my troubles. Well, I always thought that meant stingy and conceited, and I wasn't either. Maybe a little conceited from time to time, but certainly not stingy. Well, boy, did I understand that totally different today, and now what I understand is selfish and self-centered means all I think about is me. I may not be much, but man, I'm all I think about. So whatever you do is going to directly affect me. And how does this affect me? And it's all driven by that fear she was talking about. But here's the deal. It says selfish and self-centered. That we think is the root of our trouble. So here we got this root bound in a tree, right? And if you've ever, if somebody says, go get rid of that tree and you cut it down to the bottom of the stump, that's pretty easy. No, we want you to take it out root and all. Oh, that's going to, that's going to be really difficult, man. Those roots run deep. Oh yeah. Yeah, the root of your problem is selfish and self-centered. That's my problem. So the tree, I look at it, kind of, I'm kind of a visual person since I didn't learn much in school. And um, so you got this root of a tree, right? And then the trunk is the fear. So it says driven by fear. Well, let me give you an example of what that looks like. Have any of y'all ever tried to get out of a moving vehicle? Everyone in this room has. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and usually you are mad as a wet cat, right? And, I mean, you're even opening the door at 60 miles an hour, sticking the leg out that's, you know, shaking, trying to figure out if you can jump far enough so the wheel doesn't hit you. In sobriety. And that feeling of having to just, you're driven by that fear. That's what driven means. Is you've got to go, you've got to go now. And then it says self-delusion. Well, that's what our disease is. It's a disease of delusion, not denial. Denial means once I know the truth, I can't go back there. Delusion means I believe the lie. Right? So I've got this disease of delusion. So all of a sudden, man, say somebody tells you something. Perfect example, you're at work, you know, and somebody, you, you, there's a couple of co-workers you don't like. You see one of them walk out of the boss's office. They look at you and go... What? What was that for? And the boss walks out, looks at you. Oh my God. Well, I know what they're doing. Yeah, they're in there talking about me. There. And then you, you haven't even walked down the hallway. Of... And I mean, that sucker is going because that fear of that look 
You are going to write the script, right? Me too. That's what. You know, one phone call, you know, one one little piece of paper laying there. What is that? What are they doing? They're talking about me. What are they going to fake me? And then you go into that level that Serena was talking about—that self-seeking. See, I better go put out the fire to this delusional story I'm believing. So then you go put out a fire to a story that ain't even happening. Right, and so then you're looking like an absolute idiot. You step on the toes of your fellows. They retaliate, seeming without provocation. But didn't we see where we made a decision based on me? <laughs> that later placed me in a position to be harmed.、Mm-hmm. Right, and so here we go. So here's what that does. That happen? That happens. I don't care if you're 50 years sober. That happens. All the time. See, I thought that would go away. I thought that fear, that gut punch, I call it, would go away.、Mm-mm. It doesn't go away. The gut punch happens. I reach over and open my toolkit, and my toolkit is a spiritual toolkit, and I immediately have a default setting of prayer. Immediately, I can tell how I'm doing in a good spiritual day. If I get gut punched by that fear, which is going to happen. I thought it wasn't. I don't know why I thought it wasn't, but it is. I go to prayer. My default setting is immediately prayer. When I am not doing spiritually well, which means I'm probably not doing my disciplines of ten, eleven, and twelve, I go to think, 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 <laughs> and then that's when somebody walks up to you and they're talking to you and their lips are moving and I'm not even hearing a word they're saying.、So. I mean, this is a disease of self, and we aren't joking around. I'm not kidding you. At one point, at that border patrol, I thought we're all going down. <laughs> I'm crazy. The book tells me I'm crazy. I know I'm crazy. I am outright mental defect. I know that. I'm capable of going to jail in sobriety. <laughs> So you know that does not, does not come as a shock to me. You know the the scene in Fried Green Tomatoes, where the woman rams that car. That can be me. I really love that scene, and and you know, and so that's what I'm talking about, though, guys. On page 62. So when the book talks about you know that we need that one of the things when you're an untreated alcoholism or not even untreated alcoholism, you know, for some of you guys that may be really bugging you, and if it's really bugging you, <laughs> fill in the blank. But. Here's the other thing. It, I call it the drunk prayer. It's the prayer that we ask God to remove this pain, and He doesn't. And what's wrong? Why won't He remove the pain? Because of cause and effect. We want Him to remove the pain, but we don't want to give the guy up. See, we want Him to remove the pain of our financial needs, but those shoes are on sale. <laughs> See, see that we're not ready to do the other thing, you know, and that, and that's what I, I didn't get that as the drunk prayer, you know, is what I tell my sponsees. I go, it's the drunk prayer again. I mean, the one that said, please make it be better today. I'll swear I'll quit drinking till five, four, you know. So it's the cause and effect prayer, and that's what he's asking. God's saying you got to surrender everything. Well, you know, people say you know you need more humility. Well, don't be so selfish. You're working on your character defects. You can't. We can't. Don't get to work on these. See, the book tells me they're all over me. I mean, I can try not to lie, cheat, and steal, right? I mean, I can try to do those things, but I can't work on being less selfish. It says we can't wish it away or will it away, no matter how hard we try. Can't do it. See, I thought I could do it. That's me managing me, self fixing self. Oh, if that went over your head, I understand. It went over my head for years. You know, if you're sitting there going, "How much longer is this chick got?" <laughs> I understand that too. You know, hang around; it'll make sense later. Okay. So the other thing that I think is spectacular is the second half of the third step prayer: "Take away my difficulties, so that victory over them may bear witness to those I will help." So God, you're telling me this pain I'm in, this fetal position, snot flying, pulling the eyelashes out, <laughs> is going to help somebody? Yes. So I'm going to take that pain away, not so Katie feels good about Katie. It's so I can help you with it. How many of you guys, when you sponsor, does not does that sponsee not come up to you with the exact 
situation you had. Yeah, it's because God took it away from you so you could help someone with it. And yet, when they bring it to you, you're so pissed off at them. <laughs> oh, for God's sakes, don't just see it. <laughs> and you're like, whoa, what happened to the compassion? <laughs> you know, come on. And so, so you're sitting there. And, and the other thing that amazes me is, you know, in 10, 11, and 12, the 10th step means that you immediately call your, I, it says to call somebody. I say it needs to be your sponsor because I think we are pretty crafty, you know, and we're going to call the people we want to call to kind of tell this group about this and this group about this and this group about this. But it says that we ask God at once to remove it. We call somebody immediately. We make an amends if we stepped on their toes. And we turn our thoughts to someone that we could help, right? So that means at that moment, you need to have a little bit of a prayer list going, right? Absolutely. So there's plenty of people that are hurting out there. I mean, I got, I, I'll text somebody. If somebody comes up to me and says, my brother Mike can't get sober, I text all my sponsees and go, we need to be praying for a guy named Mike. Just do it. Okay, and what that means is when they're doing a 10th step, which you will do every day, yeah? When, it's just, when these crop up, you know it by heart? What is, what's cropping up? Selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Well, that's my day. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. That's what I got cropping up, right? And I mean, I am 24 years sober. I am knee-deep in Alcoholics Anonymous. I sponsor 20 people. I go out to a treatment center every Thursday, bringing steps one, two, and three. With Charlie and I do a big book study on Tuesday nights that has 175 people at it. We had a big book weekend that had 250 people in it. You sponsor 20 women. You darn sure better keep them in the work or you're going to be a armchair therapist you know what I'm saying and um, you know uh, there, there's nothing about this life coach this cheerleader you know I am my my job is to take you through these 12 steps to get you in touch with a power that can solve your problem God says in the second step it says there are terms or excuse me in the third step the terms we make are to stay close to him and perform his work well it doesn't say anything in there about getting a better job. It doesn't say anything. Yeah, should we go out and apply for a job? Oh, absolutely. You know, don't sit on the couch at the AA club all day long. Of course, get your lazy butt up and go get a job. But, you know, you stay close to him, perform his work well, which means you do four through nine, which means you're clearing away that debris, right? You got a whole river of debris. I got five more minutes, by the way. Um, you got, I am keeping an eye on this clock. Okay, you got this whole river, right? And these logs are going through it. You got all sorts of stuff. And you look over at my river, and it's pretty doggone clear. Periodically, a log goes by, and you go, Katie, I want what you got. I go, well, we're going to have to clear out that debris. Because in order for you to stay close to him, you've got to be unblocked so the sunlight of the Spirit can come through, right? And so that means four through nine. That's the action. That's the action step. So it's like a flashlight. You put your hand over it. It blocks it. You move it. There's the sunlight of the Spirit, man. Get your butt right in that four step. you got two weeks if you're working with me. And that's it. And you could really do it in two hours, for God's sakes. But, you know, you give them two weeks, they're going to do it in the last two hours anyway of the two weeks, you know. And so you do, the, you do the inventory work with them, right? You start unblocking them. You make six and seven powerful, powerful. You explain as a good sponsor straight out of the book what that hour is supposed to look like, man. you got to go through those whole steps. you got to believe that you got a disease, that you got a physical allergy and a mental obsession, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're talking the, six, the third step. you got to go 60 to 63 with them. That's going to take a full hour. And you take that hour in six and seven, that nonsense of just reading six and seven. That's not going to make a bit of sense to anybody. The fifth step is running back through those questions that it asked you in the book. Then you start the amends process. That process takes an entire lifetime. Yes? You don't get to just walk away from those ones that you started in the beginning, right? The ones that kind of were the flamethrower at your butt. And you got to go, it says make all. That means i got to go back and find those teachers and all those people. And then when it talks about the 10th step, that's that, you know, doing that deal. And the 10th step is a daily deal you have to do. And the 11th step is twofold, right? The 11th step is an evening review. The book tells you clearly that you're going to review to be sure you did the 10th step. Well, I don't know about you guys. I wasn't doing anything. 
<laughs> I mean, nothing. I was going to meetings. Could somebody unplug this chick? Because she's bugging me. <laughs> right? And that's exactly what Mark was doing to me. It's like, shut him up, man. I am not doing anything. And I darn sure don't need to hear it. Because then I got to do something. So I'm doing an evening review now. And then all of a sudden I'm doing prayer and meditation. And what that prayer and meditation looks like for me is in 1935, the word meditation means deep thought, contemplation, right? I thought it was the 60s and the Rosh Hashanah, Kanapanatana, and that I had to sit in this, you know, incredible silence. And I tried it forever and it didn't work. It, that total silence clear the mind. Have you seen the level of personality I have? There is no... <laughs> It's not going to happen. I've tried forever. It made me angry. I couldn't get there. I went and did the 30-minute meditation. I'm thinking about knitting, grocery shopping. I mean, it was like all sorts of things flying. People go, you just need to calm your mind. Well, I can't. So what I ended up doing was I brought this whole little level of world to me. But here's the deal. The book tells me I have to be divorced of three things. If you don't know those three things, I hate to be the burden of bad news, but you're not working the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. It says you must be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, and self-seeking motives. First thing in the morning, you know why? What's the first thing that happens when you open your eyes in the morning? You are not clicking your heels. Don't you lie to me. You so are not clicking your heels. You're like going, oh, what time is it? Oh, my God. Oh, go make the coffee. <laughs> then you start thinking. About three weeks ago and that idiot what they said. And then you go, oh, my God, and it's Easter, so i got to go see my mother and then, see what I'm saying and so it says that you've got to divorce yourself from those things and then the last part of the terms you make is to stay close to him right perform his work well which means you're doing the 12th step you have to have had a spiritual awakening to do the 12th step that's all the requirement we're asking right and here's the deal guys and I'll wrap it up Thank you, too, again to Josh for surrendering Saturday night. That was not easy to do, and I really appreciate that. I'll be leaving your country at 9 a.m. in the morning, I swear to God. And I really want you to think about us, because we'll be crossing with no passport for my uh, Korean husband. I swear to God, all I can think about is, who stole his passport? I mean, we are. you talk about delusional. Thinking about, you know, that whacked out newcomer that came over to the house. So, oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, when, when they said it had been stolen, punched by that fear. So I got to figure it out, man. So here's the deal, guys. The, the, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is the 12 steps. The fellowship is the meetings. And then there's service. Yes, we understand the triangle. If you are not experiencing joy, and I mean real joy, 90% of the time, that doesn't mean ups and downs, ebbs and flows, financial. It, it's all life. That's life. But it's the joy that you can feel. It is in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's there for you. Trust me, but you've got to get somebody who knows the book to teach it to you. It's not about a life coach. It's not about a cheerleader. It's directly straight out of the book. And I'd like to close with the really cool reading that I like. It's out of a Daily Reflections. It says, mysteries are a paradox. I really believe the 12 steps are a paradox. Such is the paradox of AA's regeneration, strength arising out of complete defeat and weakness, the loss of one's old life as a condition for finding a new one. What glorious mysteries paradoxes are, they do not compute. Yet when recognized and accepted, they reaffirm something in the universe beyond human logic. When I face a fear, I am given courage. When I support a brother or sister, my capacity to love myself is increased. 
When I accept pain as a part of the growing experience of life, I realize a greater happiness. Whew. Let me tell you, when I'm in pain, I am not thinking this is going to be a happy moment. <laughs> when I look at my dark side, I am brought into a new light. When I accept my vulnerabilities and surrender to a higher power, I am graced with an unforeseen strength. I stumbled through the door of AA in disgrace, expecting nothing from life, and I've been given hope and dignity. Miraculously, the only way to keep the gift of this program is to pass it on. Thank you so much for having me.